Um, without further ado, I do want to hand it and get our show started here. So, Dr. Lieberman, I am going to hand it off to you to uh, introduce our guest speaker today, Daniel Adams. Um, and so, Dr. Lieberman, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Joe, also for the announcement. I encourage students always to go for awards and um, any kind of scholarship opportunities. A lot of those things are left on the table and they're really worthwhile uh, pursuing those. And um, so I am extremely happy to welcome Dan Adams to our lecture series. This is the final lecture. So I hope it acts as inspiration, a kind of mental creative break from your crunching for studio right now. Um, Dan Adams is a founding partner along with Marie Law Adams of Landing Studio in Somerville, Massachusetts, that's right next to Boston, where they focus on designing the intersection of infrastructural and industrial environments and the urban public realm. This works has resulted in a, awarded designs of Salt Dock Public Parks, um, a Department of Public Works public park, under highway public spaces, Salt Dock Theater, a Salt Dock COVID food hub, as well as installations, buildings, and events, and operations um, and maintenance agreements. So Dan is the director also of the School of Architecture at Northeastern University in Boston, um, based, I would say, on the kind of excellence of the work that, that he has done with Landing Studio. And he's a graduate of Harvard University and University of Michigan. I think one of the really interesting things about Dan's contribution to this semester's theme, the role of technology in architecture, is that it is a different take on technology. So it's sort of a way of expanding as well as kind of focusing our understanding of what that can mean in, uh, in architecture. And he and his partner, Marie, really have redefined like what an architectural practice can be and what kinds of questions that architecture can address. So with that, um, welcome Dan Adams. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me, uh, you know, virtually, obviously I wish I could be there in person to visit you all, visit your campus, but I'm really delighted to share this work. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Um, is this uh, coming through, uh, Vonda? Great. Um, so as Vonda said, uh, you know, it, it's really a very sort of luxurious opportunity for me to think about uh, our work in a, in a slightly different way maybe than we normally do. Um, uh, I kind of gave it this goofy title, um, technology, mainly because I had it, it just never occurred to me that the word ecology actually sits right in the word technology. I, I don't know why I had never noticed that before, but when I was thinking about the lecture, it had dawned upon me, and I don't normally go with these, I don't know, goofy kind of titles, but it just... Uh, Maybe it'll make sense in a minute. Um, and I guess that my appreciation for being able to just think about the work in this way is this notion of productive frictions, which is a really, um, it's a sort of critical part of how we approach our practice, which is to really think about kind of where does new urban space and urban design come from? I should say uh, my sort of partner in this work is Marie Law Adams. Uh, we are partners in work and in life. and. Uh, you know, we founded our practice back in 2005 and have been trying to really focus on the implementation of new forms of industrial relationship in city, in cities, which is where this notion of productive frictions come from. Um, for me, in the context of this lecture and this talk, I think the productive frictions is really in the notion of sort of challenging our work to think about it through this technological lens and maybe think about our work in slightly new ways, uh, which is a luxurious opportunity for us. Um, the, pic the picture on the screen right now is one I love a lot. Uh, we, doc we do a lot of our work through photography, so that I'll have a lot of slides, a lot of images. I'll try and move through them quickly. Uh, but I love this moment. This is the moment where nature becomes industry, um, uh, which is, I think, a really uh, sort of strange phenomenon in our economy and politics. This is essentially um, a salt production facility. Uh, um, I'm going to situate my work in sort of two parts today, first talking about sort of the inheritance of some sensibilities um, and then talking about some projects, sort of technological sensibilities. Um, and I, we, we've kind of, uh, you know, of recent, I guess, really just been thinking a lot. There's obviously a lot of discourse today in urban design and architecture on notions of ecology which is really a question of less like what is architecture and a little bit more of what does architecture do? Um, and just, I think, you know, two uh, sort of context for this. I don't know why they both talk about numbers of ecologies, but it's kind of interesting. They, um, 
uh, Rainer Banham in his four ecologies of Los Angeles. Uh, you know, he really dives into something like surfing and just questions like, where does some, something like surfing as like an urban phenomenon even come from? And what a weird amalgamation of natural systems and, um, you know, foam boards and the technologies of compressed foam and transportation systems like the rail versus urbanization strategies like the sort of California coastline commercial street boulevard phenomenon all gives rise to a whole designed culture uh, that's very much designed through an interrelationship of seemingly isolated designs, but coalesce into something as sort of beautiful and interesting as surfing. And then I like to juxtapose that against like Atari and his three ecologies, not four of um, the kind of different layers through which architects change space uh, and, and sort of craft and ask this question, what does architecture do? So the three ecologies are commonly defined or I sort of simplify them. Atari is a little hard to read, but of uh, environmental, you know, the question of how does maybe one biology relate to another biology, you know, sort of classic ecology, like how does a squirrel relate to a tree? Social, you know, which is the sort of strange concept that architecture really shapes how people relate to each other um, in profound ways. Um, mental, which is the kind of idea that architects shape the way people think about the world. And the, the fact that that mental ecology can be radically different than let's say actual environmental relationships. So if Vonda and I are having a conversation, obviously what's going on in her head can be radically different than what's going on in my head. Um, and architecture uh, similarly can um, shape those different perceptions, which are equally structuring of the world as any sort of physical artifact we create. And then I've added here, just because as I was laying out the presentation, it came to my mind, this kind of concept of a legal uh, ecology, which is, I think, the kind of increasingly radical divergence between the kind of regulatory domains that exist and the actual domains that we participate in and how architecture actually works between those. So be it through zoning or regulations or laws versus what's actually going on on the ground and the kind of reciprocation between those two worlds. So those are a couple sensibilities that I want to kind of rip through here uh, to then set up some of our projects. Um, and I should say, so a lot of, I guess, where we launched our firm was uh, coincidental with a really nice fellowship that we got where we got to kind of travel uh, to a lot of places in the world looking at the specific um, the, the salt industry in the world. And uh, there's a lot of reasons we were looking at salt. It, it, you know, it's a really interesting kind of moment where, like I said, nature becomes industry. And what a strange sort of boundary uh, of watching how people can manipulate nature to, you know, economic, political, social, cultural gain. And uh, I guess we were really, uh, I don't know that we even set out for this, but I think we learned a lot of architectural lessons in that process of studying these facilities around the world. So I'm going to share some of those lessons and then maybe translate them to some of our projects and along the way talk about some of the technologies that we've sort of identified. Um, so this facility, uh, I think, is really quite remarkable. This is in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And what you're seeing here is, a, you know, an architecture of the landscape for essentially uh, producing salt um, through intensifying evaporation. Right. And so what the process is, is it's, it's just really humans sort of riding the wind of time and the evaporation of a great ocean, the uh, Bonneville Ocean, which maybe it could be described as a massive lake, uh, which was primarily in Utah um, and is now famous as being a series of salt flats that's still in a, you know, multi millennia period of evaporation. And what we as people are essentially doing is just like tapping that geologic process to kind of speed it up a little bit to our industrial and economic goals. Uh, you know, and when we visited, I think what was just really remarkable was talking to people like on the ground. And, you know, he, this guy, the pond tender was talking about, I like birds. That's why I like my job. You know, nothing to do with salt. And you start talking and you realize, oh, wow, this is a pretty intense uh, operation here because you're producing salt. But you're also producing, in this case, what you're seeing is brine eggs, which are the eggs of a type of fly, which once basically you create this 
ecosystem where you're in creating this intense sort of salt brine that attracts certain species, in this case, a fly. And then those flies actually, you know, hatch and uh, attract all sorts of birds across the country to the point that it's well documented that bird migration patterns have moved uh, across the country to converge at this location, these industrial production facilities because of that intensification of nature, right? And so you realize uh, that that sort of architecture, again, not so much like what it is, but what it does in this case, like just the sort of simple technology of speeding up the evaporation rate of water shifts bird migration patterns. What an amazing environmental ecology. And, you know, when you zoom in, so that's at one scale, that's at maybe the global scale of birds moving across Earth, you sort of zoom in at another scale. And here you see the kind of salt crystals itself, which humans are kind of intensifying, growing faster and faster. In salt growth, there's this beautiful geometry that forms called the spiral dislocation, which is how crystals grow into these sort of perfect cubic crystals. And of course, this is like a specific climate on Earth. So the in American economics and politics, this is the location of the Golden Spike National Monument, where the two railroads were brought together in many ways to harvest these industrial resources. We built all these kind of uh, architectures like jetties, primarily to capture petroleum in the Great Salt Lake, because often where you find salt, you find petroleum deeper down. <sighs> And, you know, amazingly, what you see is like designers, and this was just like a really inspirational piece for us in this way. This is Robert Smith's Spiral Jetty, you know, taking all those considerations, uh, the jetty, the rocks, the turning radius of the truck, the kind of chemistry of the water. And he was really intrigued at how this kind of spiral geometry could, you know, change the stagnation of the water to actually create the red algae, the the more stagnant the water gets, the more red the water gets, the sort of symmetry between the chemistry of that water and human biology, particularly blood. And I think what was so powerful about that design to us to think about was all the ways that a very simple architectural construct, in this case, the spiral, could have all these kind of environmental impacts. So just like the uh, salt facilities, it's literally moving birds, it's moving flies and and yet have all these kind of cultural references and be derived from all of these, like let's say embedded environmental principles to ultimately lead to the technology of the spiral that sort of, you know, is simultaneously a design about molecular structure, salt growth, evaporating oceans, flies and birds, right? So it's like, is, are you designing a spiral or are you designing bird migration and, um, and flies? Uh, which from an environmental ecology question was super interesting. And, you know, Smithson in some ways, you know, I won't say ignored some of the other parameters. He touches on them in different ways, but, you know, you even zoom out. I think it's more radical than even what he wrote about when you step back and be like, wow, those salt production facilities, what are they really making? That that entire system, that entire bird migration movement, for example, is, is to produce a uh, pool softening salts that are so exclusively distributed through Walmart. So this is a Walmart, you know, pool softening um, production system that is creating this environmental ecology. So it makes us really think about the kind of social implications of these eco ecological systems. And, you know, a different place that we were looking at, this is Ile de Ré, France. It's a very low lying island. Uh, environment uh quite sort of beautiful i guess you could say in terms of the character and this whole kind of constructed canal system and the sort of social ecology here this is uh uh marina abramovich project one of her early projects i just always love just because of the kind of um almost comedic quality of this of you can see how architecture so dramatically has the potential of influencing social relationships, good, bad, awkward, where people are literally forced to squeeze through these naked people passing through a doorway and the kind of relationship of architecture to that space or, you know, Hertzberger's lessons for students of architecture and the ability of architecture to shape social relationships, right, quite physically. And I guess what Il de Ray, and then I'll show another site in a minute, sort of taught us was how these seemingly um, benign, and this is another reason we were studying salt, is salt is so neutral, it's so cheap, it's so everyday, it's like talking about the air. Salt is literally everywhere on earth. It costs almost nothing. I can just like walk out to the beach and get some salt if I want it. 
Um, so it itself is almost nothing in our systems because it is so ubiquitous and it's so common. It's literally in my blood. Uh, it's in the ocean water. It's one of the most abundant minerals on earth. And so what, why we were studying salt was it was almost like a way to study a global neutral, like, oh, and you could really study a place by studying salt because salt's almost irrelevant. So it just reveals all these aspects of a place. So in Ile de Ray, what was so interesting, you see this low line island, you know, um, off the coast of France. And they've essentially calibrated, you know, like agriculture in the US, they've essentially calibrated the island to be a salt production machine. So the whole like island performs in this production of salt. Simply, it's a mixture of the kind of clay based sediments and this beautiful product called the fleur de sel, which you'll sometimes find in very like high end restaurant, which is basically the flower of salt. That is the water evaporates, the salt grows. And you have these people called sauniers who uh, rake the salt off the surface through these sort of delicate ponds where the ponds evaporate with wind and sun. And I think from a sort of technological perspective, the thing I found so sort of amazing about this was just the, like the sheer simplicity by which this entire industrial machine was operating, where when you want to like really move water fast through the system, you pull out that whole shake. But when you want to really calibrate it to sort of small flow, you just pull out the cork, right? And then otherwise, like that degree of uh, sort of, um, I guess, minimal precision, we often call this sort of an elegant detail, how like one small design detail can manifest and regulate a huge network. And in this case, an entire sort of production and cultural um, product. So what you see here is like this whole image, this organic quality, this like zero petroleum input, the product, you know, coming from France and this beautiful landscape coupled with the image of this, you know, this sort of beautiful imagery of the guy raking the salt becomes this cultural icon, this sort of brand, the Saunier, right, is on all the package of the Fleur de Sel product, which is sold at exorbitant prices, you know, around the world because the sort of embedded cultural and social value that this ecology creates. And so you see here, this cost five and a half euros back in the day. I mean, just to be honest, I can buy a ton of salt from our industrial mines, uh, 2000 pounds I can buy for less than that. <laughs> um, but what you're of course buying here is sort of a social cultural value to the point that people travel there to even participate in the process, right? And then it's amazing because you take that exact same process and you recontextualize that in this case, in the salt flats of Mumbai, uh, where they use the exact same kind of calibration system, um, uh, very similar kind of clay-based uh, dike systems, in some ways a more radically dynamic, in this case, nomadic family units that are moving through, uh, this is actually now at Sambahara Lake in Rajasthan, um, uh, to produce uh, essentially an identical product that then has an entirely different cultural meaning and cultural valuation. In this case, these facilities are producing government rations, which are issued out by the government to ensure sort of nutrition delivered to the citizens. So it's sort of part of a public sector. You can see public se sector for serving the nation. So amazingly, you start to see how the kind of uh, consistent architecture, consistent technology becomes entirely socially and culturally situated um and radically different though identical uh between these two environments um and in the end inherits entirely different sort of cultural significance to those communities a form again of social ecology uh <clears throat> So moving on to the mental ecology as sort of a, an archetype we focus on a lot. The ideal X is this sort of amazing ship. Post-World War II, you had all these uh, T2 tankers that were left over. And, you know, the famed story is a New Jersey truck driver had this sort of realization like, wow, how inconvenient and laborious and human in a way, how humanly flawed it was to engage people in moving goods from trucks onto ships. Like... He kind of looked at it and it was like, wow, you know what's really slows this down from an efficiency perspective is people. Because people, they drop stuff, they make mistakes, they ask questions, they wonder why we're shipping, you know, food from our poor, impoverished country to a wealthy country. Why are we doing that? You know, so people are kind of like in the way and they slow things down. And so 
a pretty you know revolutionary technology at the time was the invention of containerization which really on the screen here shifted you know the relationship of people to goods to uh, a, a broken relationship right where most of us today have very little knowledge about our participation with our material footprint we kind of don't know where our stuff comes from uh, we certainly don't know who was involved with making it. We don't know who produced it and we don't know what its impacts on the environment were because we're disassociated. And those are not unintentional designs. Like it was very intentional to design containerization to eliminate people from the process, right? And so that goods can kind of just move around the world relatively unimpeded and sort of unknown. And sort of the architectural ramification or reflection of this are, you know, buildings like this. This was one I was studying at this exact same time, you know, and obviously I just thought it was amazing. It's like the same color of a lot of the world's shipping containers today. But this is in Chelsea, Massachusetts, where we do a lot of work. And it was like this famous, um, it was like a crazy moment when I was in grad school where, you know, it was discovered that a uh, shipping container full of nuclear uh, waste for weapons production was just like misplaced in this warehouse for a couple of months in Chelsea, Massachusetts, and no one knew it, right? It was just sitting in a shipping container inside this kind of building. And then you look at most ports and you sort of see that kind of architecture, right? Like a disassociation of people from their environment. And this for us is really, uh, I think, going back to Guattari's concept, like how is it that architects participate in constructing shared perception of an environment, right? So I guess the ecologies we've talked about, right, and these kind of the associated technologies are how does architecture um, shape environments and what are the kind of impacts of architecture on the environment? How does it shape social relationships and build culture in a place? And then how does it actually build perception uh, in an environment? And what's the responsibility of architecture to let's say even be kind of honest uh, versus in some ways construct a shared misconception of the environment. So transitioning now a little bit into our own work uh, at the same time that we were studying salt facilities, we were sort of pretty deeply involved with designing them. And another aspect of salt that we just found kind of interesting, it almost is a little bit of a historic model of indust industry still in the United States, where salt facilities sort of sit there, they're not hidden away in these sort of sheds and warehouses, they're open to kind of public perception for good and bad, right? But by being open to perception, they're open to critique, evaluation, consideration, uh, social ecologies and mental ecologies. So here you're seeing the kind of global convergence, right? were global resources like the Atacama Desert here, which is uh, essentially where they're mining an evaporated ocean in the Atacama Desert, <clears throat> is connected, uh, in this case, to Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm located. Or another facility in Northern Ireland, right, where underground, uh, a different ocean, this is an ocean that predates the Atlantic and the Pacific called the Zecton Sea, evaporated about 250 million years ago. Um, as the Atlantic and Pacific someday will. And we are mining that uh, between Ireland and Poland um, to again, extract materials which are brought in this case. And this is where I guess the hints for me of things like legal and uh, I'm calling it legal ecology, I guess it could be called a regulatory ecology, start to come in, right? Like how, what are the structures on earth from a jurisdictional um, and a bit of economic characteristics start shaping the kind of architecture of the world. In this case, how can it be that mining so deep underground is efficient and logical? Well, in many ways, it's just the sheer expedience of crossing the Atlantic Ocean and not needing to go through the Panama Canal from something like uh, Chile or Australia. And the sheer at the time, this is now pretty outdated information, yeah, 2010 years old already, but the sheer like savings of passing through the Panama Canal toll um it's sort of let's say offsets the the cost of mining underground and so you start to have this sort of whole economic uh ecology on earth so in chelsea massachusetts where we're working right that kind of ramifications of that are you know that on a, a summer day you look down your street and it might look like this and if a shipment comes from Mexico of recently evaporated salt, it, it sort of looks like this. And then if Chilean salt comes, it looks like this. And if Northern Irish salt comes, it looks like this. 
and the city is situated in this kind of global performance, right? And people participate in that. So in some ways, the salt is put into the ecology of the city. Um, here, you, this is actually Staten Island, where it's another similar facility, uh, just like a bus stop. You know, and people in the community react in different ways. Some, you know, this is someone who lives across in Boston Harbor, you know, who keeps a running blog and, you know, website of the kind of operations of the salt pile. And of course, others are sort of protesting the salt pile. Um, <clears throat> and this, the, the salt, you know, enters this sort of uh, cultural context, the social context, right, of a city, in this case, a, a pretty severe environmental justice community. It's very dense. It's about 50% residential and 50% industrially zoned. And it's the most dense residential municipality in Massachusetts, fifth densest in the United States, only following territories of the Bronx and New York City. <clears throat> and in this context of sort of mental ecologies and kind of how we in some ways see our work, I love the work of Joan Nasauer, is uh, someone uh, who's, I think, inspirational in sort of a weird way for us. She has these really comedic and kind of great studies of how very small changes in the built environment can uh, sort of uh, aggregate, amplify to significant like ecological transformation. So for example, she's been questioning for a while now, like why, wh what's the obsession in the United States with the American lawn, which is a known problematic ecosystem. It's very monocultural, petroleum intensive, fertilizer, chemicals intensive. It supports almost no habitat and ecology. And yet it's the kind of predominant landscape of uh, essentially suburban and um, metropolitan environments. Um, and interestingly, so many uh, efforts to, let's say, do anything other, like to sort of naturalize landscapes through meadow plantings or forest strategies are often undone by people just saying, well, I don't like it. It looks weedy. It looks out of control. It, it, it hurts my property values, right? And it, a, a complete mental construct, right? Because those things are beautiful and they're flowers and they support habitat. And so she does these all these studies of essentially what is the tipping point by which, you know, people are comfortable with the image on the left. Like, yep, I like that. That looks good. They're not comfortable maybe with the image all the way on the right, 75% native, but actually somewhere in the middle of the introduction. And so what she's been doing are a lot of cognitive surveys to essentially assess those kind of like relationships between human cognition and perception with environmental principle on the ground. So the first projects that we undertook actually when we were still students was to sort of insert designs into some of these ecosystems, maybe a little bit even kind of like naively, right? And we were working a lot with light uh, and large scale light installations. At the time, kind of an ecology and technology that was uh, coming into Chelsea, Massachusetts was there was a lot of tax incentives for the movie industry. They were trying to build jobs in the movie sector by attracting film industry to Boston. So we had this like sort of quick arrival of a lot of people who did, you know, uh, essentially film support for like lighting, recording, et cetera. And so we met some of those people and tapped into those networks. A lot of them were actually living in Chelsea, Massachusetts at the time to essentially use their uh, materials to do these pretty um, informally uh, set up installations low cost to essentially start just projecting like very everyday statements onto the salt piles, right? So in this case, like Christmas carols, like let it snow. And the light had a really beautiful interaction with the salt because of course the salt would come and go and get carved away and the light sort of adapted to that. And we could really start sort of transforming that environment, right? Um, and the text, uh, the sort of projected statements uh, sort of interacted with that. And it opened up sort of new dialogues. I should say at this time, you know, this is pre-2005, uh, you know, there's a lot of questioning about why do cities have industry? Shouldn't they just all be gone? Um, uh, wouldn't the cities be better off if we built sort of condominiums here on the waterfront, uh, high value condominiums? Um, and so industry was often sort of painted in that kind of a negative light. And it was, and yet I think people also realized their kind of dependence on it. Um, I think one of our theses or theories is that simply moving 
industry is sort of out of sight, out of mind, actually tends to uh, dislocate and divorce them from our kind of regulatory context. So, you know, you put an industry way out there, well, then you can just forget about it. And to be honest, it can get really kind of unregulated and pretty nasty. Um, where in an industry may not be, uh, in the case of salt, a, a health hazard or a great negative impact, maybe we need to think of how we actually negotiate our own industrial footprint um, and keep it as part of our perception so that it's regulated by the natural kind of productive frictions of urban environments. And so the sort of salt uh, in this case was brought into um, sort of greater dialogue with the community uh, through these types of installations. Again, for like good, you know, positive and for critique. And that set off for us a whole series of sort of like almost operations to rethink that kind of relationship, that ecology of both the environmental, social, uh, mental and um, legal relationships between industry and communities. So it started with like light projections and we started really digging into sort of events and again, translating those technologies of like lighting to sort of remake the landscape. And how could these environments be open to the public and could we start translating the kind of tools and ingredients of industry into public space? Um, in this case, this is a series of uh, film and performance art uh, festivals that we designed and kind of installed in New York City at salt facilities. And, you know, very quickly when, you know, you're working in one ingredient, in this case, light and their tools, you start working with other ingredients like the salt itself and, and figuring out even techniques of how do you work with the, the laborers on the dock to actually construct like architectures out of the salt. Um, so you're seeing some of the, what we call the salt galleries, right? Where those environments <clears throat> um, uh, can sort of be built uh, to then support the various art installations and become a essentially like a festival ground. And it was, I think, really exciting to us again here to see how actually a material that in most contexts is kind of bemoaned and in, in some ways disliked as sort of an industrial uh, necessary evil could start to become um, a sort of new ingredient in the city. And artists are obviously sort of great for reconceptualizing things in that way. Um, so you see here all the different kind of archetypes of galleries that were designed and installed and all the different material properties of the salt were, that were capitalized on it, be it, you know, the relatively uh, benign characteristics of it to you, like your skin and your body and your biology. Um, to, you know, its structurally supportive characteristics, to its reflective characteristics. And I think what we even started seeing is then even the kind of casting of the industrial landscape in, into new light. I think it's even funny in this photograph here, right? Like all the people aren't looking at the artwork, they're looking out into the industrial waterfront, right? And connecting to a landscape and a series of systems that they uh, have been really quite dislocated from. And some of the nicest moments in the event were actually as things would be wrapping up, people you know, would almost follow the artist's lead and just start to kind of reconsume the industrial landscape. So here you see people kind of just climbing on the piles, hanging out. It even like cracked us up that we would light up equipment just so people wouldn't walk into it at night. And people thought that was part of the artwork, right? And so they'd take selfies and uh, hanging out with the kind of industrial equipment. And you see art pieces like this and even the process that this uh, one small child like destroyed that entire art piece when it was done and had, you know, a great time. And the specific technologies of that are even how we specify the specific salts, you know, salt takes on really different kind of character if it's evaporated versus it's blasted out of the ground. So evaporated salt is really soft and tactile like snow to the touch. And so for us, this is like a rolling process. And I think when Vanda said it's a little bit of a way we work or a new model of practice, we often refer to this a bit as like an architect in residence almost, is that we kind of, I guess, just like this is a client, uh, a company, you know, that we've been working with since 2004. And it's really afforded us the nice opportunity to just kind of keep adding to that palette. And I think in ecological architecture, that's a, a fairly vital way of working because it's not about creating a one-off project that serves a singular purpose. It's really about designing the relationship of industry and infrastructure over time 
which is, I think, a fundamental question in sustainability today that is a flawed aspect of architecture as a discipline is the kind of one and done contract model. If what we're trying to achieve is sort of long term sustainability, well, in many ways, we need to form long standing relationships with projects and places. Um, so it's a bit of a divergence from maybe the global architect model to a very local architect model of sort of engaging with a place consistently over time, bringing kind of creativity to the operations of those systems. So sort of continuing in Chelsea, like I think what you see from lighting to festivals, it really started asking us like, well, how do we create more kind of permanent access for people into these environments? How can we kind of break down these industrial barriers? And you start looking at, well, what are the systems, the kind of ecologies, you could even call it technologies that prevent. So in 2001, after 9-11, there was the enforcement by Homeland Security of transportation worker identification credentials, which really created a lot of security sort of prohibitions on access into uh, industrial facilities. So a typical like security perimeter of a terminal like this would be the entire per terminal. You can't enter. <laughs> That's like the default in Homeland Security, even though these are public resources and public goods. And so some of the technologies I suppose that we work with aren't so much let's say mechanical innovations or material innovations, but are often these kind of legislative and legal kind of innovations where, you know, you sit down with um, Coast Guard officials and Homeland Security and actually try and drill into the regulations, you know, like, so if this is sort of the default social condition, like entire terminal, not accessible, well, what are the actual regulations? And is there a way to uh, reevaluate those to sort of have a new technology of security provisions and what it really comes down to is they just needed to see the gangways and the ship lines because to be honest they're trying to uh regulate who's coming in off the ships that's it the salt is not a concern which there's a lot of social issues we can talk about that in terms of like stowaways on ships and why that happens and maybe why as a global community we could be a little more accepting of that uh on the other hand in this context what it really meant was that the security perimeter could essentially be the gangway and view cones to ship lines right so instead of the entire terminal being a security zone something like a little shed like this and that little window there is actually the security requirement and what that opens up is the ability to kind of break down those boundaries right so this for us is where those like elegant details come in like from il de Rey and the wooden shake and the cork in this case, it's not a wooden shake and a cork. It's a it's literally a plan drawing, which could be used with the US Army or the US Coast Guard and the Homeland Security to essentially argue for achievement of security parameters <clears throat> through a drawing. So that's the kind of technology here. And what it unleashes is the ability that, you know, we can have youth groups come to the dock, we can have high school dances come to the dock. And we can even create things like public access landscapes like parks on the dock. So this was a project to transform a former asphalt batching terminal into a salt dock and public access landscape. Uh, it was a project where we recycled a lot of the tank farm. You can see here, we're demolishing the asphalt tank farm <clears throat> and then designing a shared use landscape between the sort of salt operations headquarters, the stockpiling operations, obviously ship mooring, um, and then how we could repurpose these structures to become the kind of public access landscapes. Um, some of the specific kind of technologies within this designed ecology is, uh, you know, tapping into something like the seasonality of the salt. The salt's really used in the winter. It's not really used in the summer. That's almost a nice uh, mirror of what happens for public space in Boston, where public spaces are used in the summer and not so much in the winter because of the climate. So like Chelsea, Massachusetts, despite its density, it didn't have like a single point of access to its own waterfront, it certainly didn't have basketball courts on the waterfront. You know, so could we essentially design a seasonal shared use of the landscape where in the, the winter it's used for salt and the summer it's used for basketball and event space? In that case, the kind of technologies of that, this is the sensibility, I guess, taken from like Ile de Ray are very like simple, right? You know, like how do you design a mobile fence that can just be kind of repositioned around? Um, using their kind of standard industrial products. 
And how do you make arguments? This gets into the kind of legal ecology, right? About how do you make arguments to political jurisdictions that normally prohibit public access in the waterfront? How can you create uh, arguments that actually um, these public spaces are still serving industrial good and industrial productivity? which is again where in many ways the technology for us resides in the domain of drawings, which become what we call sort of legal and politically operative drawings, right? To kind of reposition and recharacterize something um, through how we define it in drawings. So this is not something that we can call a park. This is what's called an industrial public access area. Something like this waterfront is still designed to serve ship mooring. You can't see it here, but there's a ship ball in. And the kind of documentation that makes this possible is uh, like legal agreements that we help negotiate as architects, in this case, memorandum of agreement, which are contracts, right? Which on one hand, you create sort of visual drawings like this, and on the other kind of written contracts like this that structure those relationships. And I suppose that, you know, really identifies this notion of the kind of legal ecology and the associated technologies of that, right? Is that law and regulations have a really sort of reciprocal relationship with architecture in that for the built environment, you can't, uh, you can't write policy and law about things you don't know you can build and you can't build things that are illegal, right? So there's always sort of a, chicken and egg dance between law and politics about how do you create sort of case precedents in architecture that can shift regulations of communities um, because prior to this document actually creating public access in such terminals uh, was uh, prohibited so the mou these drawings become those kind of technological devices that crack that relationship between policy law and design you know, other aspects of the MOU in that case were, you know, coming to relationships with the city about how to stockpile the salt to preserve views and to open things like basketball courts and recreation. The kind of ecological relationships that were embedded in the design are things like trying to even think about how we work with the local labor force, in this case, the workers of the salt dock, um, <clears throat> to essentially design the, the landscapes in ways that could be built by those workers. I think these were lessons we had learned from doing things like the film festivals and working with the workers to actually build those festivals. So in this case here, you can see they're very good at building piles. So we're building landscapes out of piles. Uh, and what's amazing, I think, in, about designing in that way in this kind of, let's say, developing technologies that are intrinsic to the systems of that landscape uh, and embedding them within the ecological relationships of, in this case, an industry in a city, inevitably propagates sort of new relationships so that, you know, as part of that park, we designed a former oil tank to become a, a theater space. So then the theater, local theater groups started using that space. That inevitably leads to new relationships where things like salt stages can become part of the theatrical performances. This is sort of Hamlet on the, the salt pile. Uh, or for example, uh, grave scenes on the salt pile. And now these are all kind of co-built uh, projects between the city theater groups and the industry. This brought involved a, a local uh, timber recl reclamation uh, contractor to help build this Midsummer Night's Dream stage set. And then that leads to sort of further events that we design and we help sort of negotiate between the industry and the community. In this case, these are sort of charity events. Those charity events have like led to sort of maybe new installations, right? What I'm calling these sort of technologies of socio-spatial practice, in this case, um, electric infrastructure. And I mean, I think I'm gonna close on just this last piece, right? That in that kind of, let's call this a socio-spatial technology coming out of the ecological relationship between uh, city and industry, which was essentially a profound amount of electrical service to support theater and events in the park. When COVID hit, for example, the 
you know, the city was desperate to find places to set up food distribution hubs. The big limitation for them was how to set up refrigeration technology to keep the food from perishing so they could get it distributed to people. They needed places with like ready power uh, and sort of truck capacities. And amazingly, the sort of infrastructure that we had put in place for the theater, coupled with the kind of in, sort of industrial know-how, you know, led to the ability of this property to take on a whole sort of new role in the community. Again, the kind of elegant detail of something that maybe on one hand is very overlookable, which is sort of publicly accessible, you know, voltage, um, becoming a, sort of a great public service to the community. Uh, so with uh, with that, Vonda, I'm going to stop because I know I've hit like 45 minutes here and uh, I want to make sure I leave some time for conversation. Um, uh, but, you know, thank you for this chance to share some of our research and work. Thank you so much, Daniel, for such an uh, interesting presentation. I was wondering, do you have an image that shows, is this how this space was set up um, post-COVID to um, store and distribute food to the population? It, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those remarkable things where on one hand, you're very like proud because your design is um, serving a community in a completely new way. And uh, it was a very, let's say, rapid exercise. Uh, we had about one week to get this set up. And it, since last April, has been serving about uh, 10,000 people a week with food. Um, which is a, you know, a significant portion of people. And it was also, you know, in a way very disheartening to sort of, I guess, discover how uh, sort of tenuous these infrastructure systems were that in fact, like a salt dock that just sort of happened to have good electric provision would be like the best resource we could come up with in a city for uh, providing food. Um, so we had about like one week to get it set up, but I, I think that was, you know, it's maybe one of the most fascinating lessons of that was just the, the ability to tap into sort of industrial community ecosystem relationships to quickly get you know power set up get uh containers set up get tents set up get refrigerator units set up like those kind of uh relationships were um probably more profound than any possible infrastructure system could be to just immediately address a kind of rapid community need well, if you wouldn't mind um, showing a couple of images of that, I wanted to take the time while you do that, if you can, to mention to everyone who is um, watching right now that they can either just speak up and ask questions or they can put a question in the chat space and I will transmit those questions to Daniel. So um, we've already got one from um, Jose Bernal, who says, first of all, that he thinks this repurposing of projects that you guys are doing is absolutely wonderful. That's in quotes. And um, he wanted to know whether the private owners of the facility with whom you, that, were there in, uh, kind of additional obstacles in convincing people for you to do these kind of unusual projects? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, no, I mean, um, it was a very, so this took about seven years of permitting um, to uh, build this project, um, mainly because uh, actually uh, everything about it was like illegal uh, before we undertook it. So, you know, in typical zoning policy, and this is where I mean the kind of legal ecologies and technologies, right? It's, it's kind of an amazing dance. Um, it, you know, <laughs> it gets into the weeds here, but um, state regulation in most states uh, really prioritizes regional environmental benefit, right? So man, getting goods into a region in a sustainable fashion at the scale of global commerce, right? Getting big ships with tons of cargo into a place. So actually in, in Boston Harbor, in this portion of Boston Harbor, the only potential use of the waterfront was to serve those industrial uses. It's a rigid regulatory domain. Um, on the other hand, the cities are like their environmental justice communities. They're like, we don't want more industry. <laughs> you know, uh, we got so many trucks, we got so much air pollution. We got, so what we want is just public access or housing on the waterfront. We don't want any more industry. And yet what this site was, was a former asphalt batching terminal. Asphalt batching is very detrimental to human health. It causes a lot of respiratory disease. Um, and that was the only allowable use of the waterfront owing to its grandfathered status. And so on one hand, the state said it can only be industry. The city said it cannot be industry. It must be something else. 
So what that led to was like a seven year kind of negotiation uh, where we had to prove what we what we would call a less detrimental non-conforming use uh, compared to a, a, an asphalt batching terminal um, to kind of find a negotiation. And what was amazing was there was no model of that in the state. There was no model of like a negotiated compromise of how you could create point public access into an industrial environment. And what's kind of amazing to see is now that there is a model, actually the codes in Massachusetts have changed. So it is pre-scripted now in Massachusetts. We actually had to change state law to do this, that now you can create these kind of co-shared environments, right? Which is really that kind of, um, so like, it's kind of nuts, right? Because you would think, oh yeah, like as from a technological innovation perspective, you would think, well, of course we need ways to engage industrial operations with local communities. There should be designs for that. Um, but you can't, again, regulate or legislate about things that don't exist. So if you don't have a kind of productive model of it, you can't write a code about it, right? As soon as you do have sort of proof of concept, then you can write code, which then allows this to become sort of a model in other sites. So that was the biggest obstacle, was negotiating that relationship. Um, on one hand, convincing the state that you could have public access, and on the other hand, convincing the city that you could design an industry to be sustainable and good performing for sort of its local context. I think that's really fascinating. I mean, your whole talk could actually be sort of told through the framework of, as you were calling it, legal, legal, you were calling it legal ecologies, but we could call, call them legal mm -hmm. technologies in a way too, because all the kind of bureaucratic administrative systems and organizations that we have are considered in many areas a type of technology, right? The sort of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that um, maybe the co-hosts, uh, Jeff Huber or Daniel or anybody else who is on, or and certainly any students would like, if they have any questions that they would pose to you, um, please, I invite you to do that. For some reason in um, the virtual world, the, the kind of response to a, a, an invitation like that takes a little bit longer. Um, I think I was just gonna say it's fantastic work. You know, it's fantastic work and I'm actually excited. Like I always uh, venture into these projects that are verging on what you call illegal. You know, <laughs> you know I know when we, we meet, I'm sure you don't use illegal when you're talking to uh, uh, <laughs> city city commissioners or anything but they love the the word non-conforming but yeah. I, I love the i love the, the the fact that you're you're kind of in that realm and uh working where we don't normally see these kind of public engagement these uh these public lands used or at least the, this kind of way that these mous are used uh, to mm -hmm. provide access to the water so no, it's fantastic thanks no, I appreciate it. Well, and I was going to say, Vaughn, I mean, you know, uh, sorry, I didn't have time to get to it today, but one of the big areas we've been working right now is with highway departments, right? And, you know, in the green infrastructure movement, I'd say one of the big revolutions that's happening there is it used to be that our kind of investments in infrastructure had to be very kind of monocultural, right? Like that, like highway departments can only pay for highways. And we're starting to try and find ways to build like things like parks and public spaces around highways. And what's kind of amazing is, like highway departments by federal tax code and policy cannot build parks. They can't, they can't spend taxpayer money on like parks, but what they can spend taxpayer money on are things like bike paths. Cause that's transportation, walking paths. That's transportation. Benches are prerequisites for paths because, you know, particular elderly or anyone who needs to sit down and rest for a second needs a bench lights. You got to light a path at night, green storm water management, you know, is, uh, uh, to filter the water off the highway. And that's like bioswales and beautiful meadow plantings. And so they can't build like parks, but they can build like bike paths and bioretention and meadows and lights and, and uh, benches. And so you start to realize, wow, just by like redefining something's legal description, like, yeah, benches and infrastructure for sitting, resting and human health and highways can build that. So if you just sort of recharacterize it and kind of rethink its definition, it's like you don't even have to invent anything new. You just need to recharacterize something you already have. That's that kind of legal ecology technology concept, I guess, which we're starting to kind of play around with. I think what's tremendous about the kind of work that you do is something that you touched on earlier on, which is that 
Um, you know, a lot of architecture has a kind of um, object. There is not that much understanding of the local context, um, whether it's a social or ecological kind of elements. Um, and design, buildings are designed often for their formal and stylistic properties, but very little is done, you know, post construction to understand how these spaces are inhabited and what happens. And in your case, mm -hmm. because these projects are as you say, illegal, or they don't, there's no precedent that exists for them. You have to do so much work with your client, with different agencies, um, with the neighbors. And so you actually, the projects themselves kind of emerge from this accumulation of knowledge that happens mm -hmm. as the de designer. So it has a, a kind of opposite time span and, and the kind of form that it takes up. Um, we have another question from um, Jose who is, and this actually speaks to maybe the regulatory climate of Massachusetts and ports, maybe more generally. Um, he's sort of translating the work that you do or hypothetically translating it to um, South Florida, where there are also industrial and port facilities. And he's wondering whether, you know, the work that you do can be done in other places. I mean, you'd have to speculate unless you have actually done this work in other environments and other regulatory I'm imagining the regulatory component is in some ways what you're speaking to yeah I mean this is something I think we're really reckoning with on coastlines but uh everywhere right I mean it's it's really questions of sustainability and I think that was something that hit me early on in some of this work right like on one hand like public access and let's say salt marshes along coastlines are about sustainability, right? And then on the other hand, so is like sustainable transportation systems and like, you know, a ship of uh, salt. Um, now, albeit we can talk about whether salting roads uh, is a sustainable practice. <laughs> you know, uh, that's like asking if driving cars is a sustainable practice, right? Um, is uh, is complex, you know, and, um, and and we can sort we reflect on that a lot in our work. But for example, you know, if I can't dock a ship, well, then I got to bring three thousand trucks from Port Newark to get that cargo, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the big challenges in this is this is where you this is literally where you get those kind of conflicts, right? Like on the state level, they're like, man, if we lose the ability to bring ships in, we literally are going to be dependent on Port Newark you know, in a four hour drive of trucks to get our goods. Okay. That's a problem. And then the community is like, but you know, we want salt marshes. We want uh, public space because that's what's sustainable for our community locally here. All you have to go in is, you know, 10 miles inland. And they're like, no, no, I want those ships. <laughs> you know, I don't really care if you got to park on the waterfront. I need my, you know, salt. I need my patrol. So there's this kind of, that's an environmental issue because both are right. You know, neither is wrong. I mean, it's, it's, both are right. Um, it's an environmental conflict. It's obviously a social conflict. It very quickly becomes a political and legal conflict. And so that's, yeah, I, I always like in architecture, the notion of the, we focus a lot on the kind of the footprint, the question, like, again, not what is architecture, but what does architecture do? Like in the end of the day, I don't really care what is architecture. It's like, what does it do? You know, how does it change environmental performance? How does it change social relationships between people? Uh, and architects, uh, and you know, how does it change mental understanding are not necessarily the best at following sort of, let's say, scientific methods of even assessing those impacts to your point about like post occupancy surveying, or even I've started working at here at Northeastern with like our psychology department, like so often architects have these sort of funny statements, they say like, oh, this changed people's perception of X, Y, and Z. And you're like, oh, did it really? Like, how do you, how do you know that? Uh, you know, did you, you know, follow a cognitive surveying process to assess that? Or are you just sort of intuiting? Um, so those are some of the things I think we're grappling with as architecture starts reflecting. I mean, I think it was very convenient, um, you know, I don't know, even 100, you know, 50, just 50 years ago that you could kind of build something and not be accountable for its impacts, accountable on its environmental impacts, accountable for its cultural social impacts, accountable for its mental impacts. And, and that's just no longer the case, right? Like we, we realize that what we do has so many impacts. So we kind of have to revolutionize the practice to be accountable to the full footprint of what it is that we build. Uh, but even being kind of aware of that footprint is I think a, um, a pretty radical uh, challenge. Yeah. 
I mean, I, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think your work, but I do think your work is kind of evidence of, I mean, obviously you're doing a different kind of practice, but it's because the unusual nature of your projects kind of forced that on you, right? Mm -hmm. You've kind of discovered this or created this new niche of type project type, but even more conventional, so-called conventional projects could uh, um, apply the methods that you use. They could be much more intensive. They're just not forced to typically, right? Not in the same way. Well, I wanted... we've had, yeah, we've had the luxury that depending on types of clients that we have in relationships, like I guess it, as a model for us, what's pretty cool for us is we have some relationships, for example, with the salt company or for example, more and more with the Department of Transportation and the state, there's sort of ongoing long-term, like you kind of keep figuring it out with them. And then what's nice about that is kind of lessons learned become the kind of cases for maybe more one-off projects. Um, so that kind of model of firm, I mean, I, I guess I've become, I think it's, to be honest, if you look in the history of architecture at the Albert Kahn's and the Peter Barron's who had sort of long-term industrial partnerships, I think it's only a fairly... And, and to be honest, traditionally, architects were more locally engaged. Now they've become much more global, which means they're much more detached from the subjects where they're working. Like, um, I, I actually think it's a fairly recent phenomenon that architects have such short relationships with environments. Um, uh, I think traditional modes, people worked more locally. They were more situated in their local context. So there was more of a kind of give and take, uh, less of a parachuting in of architecture into an environment. So uh, in some ways, I don't think it's not exactly like innovative on our part. It's almost more just like returning to a, a maybe a more historic model. Um, there appears to be uh, one more question. It's quite broad. So I don't know if you want to shape it to be a little bit more specific to your practice. But uh, if you can see Jessica wrote, um, speaking about human health, what are other ways that architecture can have an influence about uh, on human health, including mental health? And um, I'm gonna just, you've sort of addressed that a little bit, obviously mental and physical health can't be separated from probably environmental goods or harms. And that's something you're addressing, but maybe you can speak a little bit to that and then we'll wrap it up because we are we are over the hour and I want to be mindful of other people's time. Yeah, no, I think it's a great and yes, very big question, Jessica. You know, I, I think um, I, I really, for me, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of ways to look at it. I think the kind of footprint concept is a really interesting one, right? It's a challenge to us as designers. It's paralyzing actually as a designer. Like it's, it's absolutely paralyzing if you were responsible for everything you did as an architect, right? Like if you had, and that's my lesson for like from Smithson, for example, right? Like, no, he did not even, you never, not in a single of his documents does he write about birds as a result of spiral jetty, right? He had no conception or thought that, you know, his work would participate to, in like moving the migration patterns of birds. Um, he was kind of tapping into all sorts of uh, <laughs> other systems. But like architecture, because it situates itself into an environment is such like a powerful influence on that environment. And, you know, I think the more I've looked at it, I think, you know, there's like bliss in ignorance, right? Uh, and we maybe need a little less bliss because <laughs> like, it's very nice to just sort of make something that, you know, subscribes to your belief system and what you like. And um, so that notion of accountability and footprint I think is the greatest contemporary challenge in architecture today. Uh, this is again, even in the regulatory legal domain. I mean, it's much harder to build a lot of the types of infrastructure and architecture that we even celebrate because it doesn't conform to contemporary. So like there's like a catching up of physical architecture to even our regulatory domains where we're still using and depending on a lot of outmoded, uh, essentially now illegal, um, uh, architecture um, for our sort of day to day, but so and, and I th so when I mention things like I think it is also figuring out how to work, uh, you know, in an interdisciplinary way with a lot of other experts. To your point about like mental health, it's been super interesting. Like I said, to start working with like cognitive psychologists. That's why I like that Joan Naysauer. Uh, she's at Ohio State, I think these days could look into her work, not because she's looking at mental health specifically, but she's looking at how she's one of the few people I can actually identify who is using proper scientific methods of assessing how physical space influences human perception 
uh, because I think architects, if we kind of get it, we're starting to figure out things like, yeah, how are architects impacts even the climate? We kind of get that. We impact no sea level rise. Those are kind of predictable environmental systems. It's what I like about Qatari's observation about, you know, social ecology versus those are in some ways are the hardest in my mind, like, because they're so unpredictable. People are so hard to understand sometimes. And so social ecology, mental ecology, and Joan's really looking at, you know, how in a very simple way, uh, can very simple architecture, can we possibly come up with tools that even gauge how you make a piece of architecture? How does it change the way people feel? Like, how does it change their perception of their environment? Again, I think we often have sloppily kind of worked intuitively on those things without necessarily engaging with the professionals and the discourse that actually knows how to assess those things legit, like for real. Um, well, I think this is a great place to end because it's a kind of call to architects to more seriously take a kind of interdisciplinary knowledge that's out there, mm -hmm. which they often sort of play, I would say, are sort of superficially engaged in, but I think there are opportunities here to do much richer work as your work demonstrates. So I really wanna thank you, Daniel, for your presentation and sticking around to answer questions from the audience. And I wanna thank everyone for attending today. I um, really appreciate your hanging in there with the lecture series this year and good luck in your final projects and exams. Um, so any closing thoughts, Daniel? Well, I just wanna thank Vonda and, and FAU. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much. Really happy to sort of get this time with y'all. Great, it's been our pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, see ya. <laughs>